Hello and welcome. It's the chat. I am Manny. My guest on the program is so remarkable. Part of the community that was set up to review the Abuja master plan, how did it go? It went well, and um, the Abuja master plan at that time, at the time we did that review, was really under stress. That was before Governor Nasir Arifa as FCT minister. Um, the designers of Abuja, the Virginia Associates, and um, Ken Zotange, the people that did the Central Business District, and the people that did the other districts. If you notice, they designed Abuja more or less after Washington, D.C. And, and Brasilia. And so you have these you know, beautiful boulevards, wide roads in the middle of the city. Uh, I, I'm sure that today's designers will not do that, because they, they, we're now talking about livable cities that are workable where people can walk from one point to the other and things like that, reducing the use of cars. But yeah, that review was necessary. And I didn't stop at that review. When Governor Rufai became minister, and during some of our interactions when I was in the US, I linked him up with the, some of the original designers of Abuja, Professor Mark Nolte, who came for the review, but who teaches in a university in the US. Um, so I followed up with him in his, I, plan to restore the master plan because there had been a lot of bastardization. Yes. A lot had gone wrong. Typical of Nigerians, you know. We had just made a mess of the master plan. Thank God for the work he did in Abuja to restore that master plan. But not only restoring the master plan, we then need to um, look at the master plan again vis-a-vis -vis our behavior and how we live, how we interact. Um, if you notice, he started the Abuja bus and the Abuja taxi, the black taxis from London. But it didn't work in Nigeria why, because, why of a certain, because of a certain way we shop, the way we go to market, the way we you know, buy our food stuff. We don't go to grocery shops, we go to market. So people are carrying yams, seeds, and all of that. So um, there are some peculiarities to yeah. us, and I, there I are some things we can do. Did you introduce? The, the, the non-motorized uh, system. I didn't introduce, I promoted it. Yes, I promoted it because um, when Ojo was Minister of Transport, he pushed a lot for return to, to developing cycling lanes and you know making our cities um, open for both motorized and non-motorized transport, which was not the case in Abuja in the way the city was designed. But on probing in deep into the designers of Abuja, I found that they even made an allowance for bicycle lanes, uh, which have not been implemented. Because oh, well, you know, were supposed to How many people would you see in their lanes. same mind riding bicycles, even in Abuja? Well, that's sad, because all over the world, how people are getting themselves um, get some exercise and be and also be friendly to the environment. Riding on Okada, riding alone bicycles. Is, is uh, Okada is not even it? safe, um, yes. but bicycles where it's a very good mode of transport, at least within the city. So if you go around everywhere in the world, you will see that they even have bicycles for hire. Think of it. In left, the left to you, there wouldn't be train service, would there? There will be intra-city train service. I, I, you know, train service works in large cities when there is traffic, um, but in Nigeria. The investments, the huge investments we are making in intercity um, rail transport, for me, hmm, could better do us some job on the road. Um, uh, Nigeria is not such a large country. The distances we have are not that much. That if we can restore our tracks and make them available for um, goods and make our roads better invest more in our roads. Um, I've always shared this thought, and I hope a president will do it, to build the Nigerian interstate highway. You know, and they have a plan for it, from all the way from Portacot, through Enugu, through Ninth Mile, through Ma Makodi, go on to Akwang, um, Joss, up to Bauchi to Meduguri, we can redo our highway. 
every year there's a budget to fix those roads in bad conditions. What we need to do in Nigeria is that these foreign loans we are taking should have been used to unlock our highway system and introduce our tolling so that the roads can have diversified source of funding. Um, there is a mechanism today, toll roads today can be done electronically, the money can sweep straight into the account and you dedicate it to paying back your, your bonds, your loans and also maintaining the roads um, so that the government funds coming out of um, the roads can go into the uh, feeder roads to those highways. Um, I think that Nigeria needs to rebuild a corridor that runs all the way from Lagos through, um, uh, through Mokwa, Jeba, Bida Highway to Kanu, built from Portacourt to, um, uh, to Meduguri, and then build Abuja, Lokoja, the center of the country, Abuja to Lokoja, and connect it all the way down to the east, and take the second one through Obela, Benin, Axis, uh, to the Delta. And in that way, we can then cross the country laterally from Abuja, going through Kefi, Akwanga to Jos. So we are connecting the two highways, the ones going north-south um, to Lagos and the one going um, from Meduguri to the east. It that sounds, way... It sounds so simple. I yes, it, it, it is actually very simple. I just can't understand why we're not doing it. I don't know why they are convincing us that the rail is our solution. Um, the rail is expensive. The rail is susceptible to, um, easily susceptible to attacks in a, in a violent environment. Um, the rail is costly to maintain. And the pricing of rail travel, uh, what we are doing today, paying on Abuja Kaduna Road, is we're not paying for it. It's not even buying the diesel for those rail coaches. So if we really charge for it, the cost of the Acela Express from New York to Washington, D.C., which is a fast train, uh, the cost of it is higher than the cost of air travels to New from New York to DC. That's how train can be expensive. I don't know where we got this impression that we can have train cheaply. Um, the cost of standard gauge rail is expensive. The cost of the coaches and maintenance is expensive. Now, rail is wonderful. If the country is buoyant and we had all our roads fixed, I'll be the one to push for rail, to move some of the traffic from the road to the rail, especially goods. Um, but the way I see the country where we are today, uh, will it, suspend uh, I will not. I, I will put a hold on rail activities okay. and restore our roads. Because if you look at Kenya, that had just invested on Mombasa to um, Nairobi rail train, uh, it is already at a two hundred million dollars of losses since its inception. Two hundred million dollars of losses. If the minister was to give us the numbers on Abuja Kaduna rail, I'm sure the losses are piling. Not to talk of paying back the loan. So I think it is important that we understand that let us be driven by data. How much of travel in Nigeria is above 100 kilometers for the individual? How much of travels is above 500 kilometers? How many people actually do more than 1,000 kilometers in a single journey? You may find out that the circle of area where people travel, if you're in the southeast, may not be more than going from Anambra to Oweri and maybe to Portacot. So if you find people that go from Portacot to Lagos, which is about one of the longest distances, or from Sokoto to Kwanga, uh, from Sokoto to Abuja, you will find that if you take all the portions and do them now, and put our toll gates on it, and light up those roads that people can travel in the night, uh, we'll be freeing up a lot of capital in Nigeria. Let's look into your record books again. In 2019, apparently, you embarked on a, a health initiative didn't you? Yes, I did. What is yes. it about? So, um, I do a lot of um, physical fitness, and I can say that um, as I turned 50, I've been in fairly good health, in that I haven't had any sh reason to go to a hospital. I only go to a hospital for checks. And I have never gone to a foreign hospital for checks. I do all my medical checks in Nigeria, here in Abuja. What I figured out when I was co marshal was that many Nigerian big men who died on road crashes, there was no time to take them to their GP in London or to that their doctor in Dubai. What will kill you in Nigeria is more likely to have finished you before you get to your doctor in Canada. So your best bet in Nigeria is to have the doctors that know you here. Having the president of a country 
in medical treatments abroad really has something to do with our national image. It has to do with our national psyche. I would like to see a Nigerian president that sees it as a matter of national pride. That no matter what it will cost us, no matter what it will be the cost on us, our governors and presidents are getting their treatment in Nigeria. Our elites are coming to that hospital, which is our prime hospital in Nigeria. That was the idea of the national hospital, but I don't think we pushed it to its logical conclusion. Why haven't we been able to retrieve our national airline? Because I don't think there's any reason for government to run an airline. So what I think should be our national airline is to encourage private companies who are in the aviation business to flag our national flag. We need a flag carrier, we don't need a national carrier. United Airlines is not an American airline. British Airways is not a British government airline. Dubai owns an airline, Emirates, but if you look at the management, I mean the MD is from it's a British guy. So it is important that so we you say same don't. For Ghana and, yes. Uh, okay, Kenya so let's take away let's Ethiopia. let's take a look at the African airlines. Ethiopia has is at the Horn of Africa and has aviation as its major income earner. Kenya Airways is on life support machine. South African Airways is on oxygen. It's about 300 and something million dollars in oxygen. Kenyan Airways have been sold to KLM. KLM have also sold it back to the Ethiopian Kenyan government because of the cost of the losses mounting in that airline. So you have to see the peculiarities of countries that hold, own national airlines. They do it because it's like they're owning their own national oil company. That's what it, Ethiopian Airlines means to Ethiopia. It's their national oil company. That's where they get their dollars from. I don't think there's any reason why we shouldn't encourage our airlines to come together. Um, my attitude as minister was to encourage the pension funds to invest in the airline, diversify ownership, that we don't have any single owner of an airline like ARIC or Airpeace or Co. We have institutional investors and they have the capacity and the muscle to bring in big aircrafts and they can fly the Nigerian flag. They can take over a bilateral agreement. Pick a question. Let's go. Oh. Have you ever found yourself on the wrong side of the law, violating traffic law? Interesting. King of the road. <laughs> the answer is no. What do you um, mean? You have never committed any traffic offense? So, I've committed traffic offense in the U.S. Oh, you have? Yes. Arrested and, and prosecuted? Uh, I was, no, I wasn't prosecuted. I, um, it was actually the um, policeman saw me over the speed limits. Uh, actually, the cameras got me over the speed limits. So they sent me the tickets and I paid. In your academic life, you did a little bit about policy. Public policy. Yeah. Public, public policy. What, what to you is a reflection of good governance? One of the misconceptions about government in Nigeria, and I think it's an African problem, is the fact that we think our leaders have the incentive to deliver good governance. Um, Nobody, me inclusive, we do the right things if there is no fear of either sanction or public censure. So the whole idea that good governance is something that the government will provide is a farce. Wherever you see um, poor governance or um, bad governance, that means that the people have acquiesced. Wherever there are people are monitoring you and are watchful and they are discharging their obligation as citizens of asking questions. That's why if you go to annual general meeting of companies abroad, you see activists coming to oil companies, asking them how many people did you kill on the roads delivering your fuel? How much pollution have you done on the environment? And you can see how the world is changing to a green economy. Very few times do we stop to say, Governor, uh, can you explain to us how much is your security vote and how much have you withdrawn in cash in the last one month or six months? Can we get a report on what is going on? So good governance is a function of when people, when there is incentive for good behavior, when people 
work together to make sure that there is no discretion allowed to those in public office. Of course, there are the transformative leaders, people who come and put in those measures to encourage transparency, improve systems, but then again, it depends on the incentive structure of the society. So, for me, good governance in Nigeria is absent. Is, is it also leading by example? No, it's not just leading by example, because you see, you have to be sure that the example that you are leading by is being internalized by the people who are watching you the know, example. The reason I'm saying this is that if you look at traffic offenses in Nigeria, a lot of people who would have been caught, especially road safety, the police, you know, the uh, army, they are all responsible for, you know, bad driving on our roads. Are these the people you refer to who have been arrested and prosecuted? We used to arrest the FRC drivers. Including the FRC We used drivers. to arrest the FRC drivers. When we installed, I used to have almost um, maybe 30, 40 road crashes involving FRC vehicles in a year. So we installed speed trackers on them, speed limiting devices and trackers. So sometimes we, read, we call another command, say there's a vehicle coming. The driver has been over speeding. Once he gets to that point, please arrest the driver and let another driver take over and bring him back How to headquarters. Such drivers? Yes, Your quite drivers a number. And when we did that, our crashes fell to zero because we brought every driver under, you know, under that uh, regulatory regime. So what has happened with the police, the army, and all of that is what I call the failure of the Nigerian state. You will see a governor in a convoy and the convoy will be driving against traffic, led by a policeman. The ADC of the governor is sitting in that car. The army officers are sitting in that car. Even the governor? Forget the governor. I want to, he's a civilian. I'm just waiting that the military people, the people who are sworn to the law, to obey the law, <coughs> should be the ones to tell the governor, <laughs> governor, we can't drive against traffic. Yes. When they were swearing in, President Biden, one of the images I shared on my Facebook page was that his vehicle plate number, titled 46, which is the 46th president, had a Washington DC plate number with a tag showing the date of the, uh, the expiry date of the tag. So I think, you know, they normally will put the month and the year. So you see the two tags, 0 to 21. So you know that in February 21, your car is due for renewal of the car tag. Now, the president's car had the tag. I said, this is a law and order society. Where the people in charge of the president's convoy goes to the DC DMV, registers the president's car, and brings the tags, and actually put it on the car, instead of covering the plate number like we do in Nigeria. The president's car had a tag. This is the power of example you are talking about. You may be going on a holiday to a seaside where you're all alone for 10 days mm. and you're allowed only five items, no human beings. Mm. Oh. My laptop, yep. my iPad, yep. my book, mm -hmm. one book, a jeans mm -hmm. and a t-shirt. Okay, well I'll consider jeans and t-shirt as clothes. One item, clothes. Yes. Okay. So I'll take my clothes yep. and then I'll take this other three items and of course in my clothing will be my running shoes okay so those are That's five items riding. yes right how important is a, a trip to an island to you what would you be reflecting on i don't know um i have a certain sense of mortality um i'm fascinated by the idea of death and living mm -hmm. um I've always wondered what happens at death and how much consciousness do we take away at the time we pass over. And the fact that all that is important to us, everything that we've acquired, everything that we have loved is left behind when we pass on is something that has fascinated me and impacted on how I find it difficult to attach myself to material things because I know that ultimately I have to let go of all of this one day. So um, I have a fair idea where I'll be buried, 
and I have a fair idea of the ceremony around my burial. Um, I would like them to sing uh, Kene Jesus, uh, an Igbo song. Well, well to me, that's yes. still very far away. You're a young yes. man. So you I know? don't think of that and age. My yeah. father is 95, he's alive. And um, I have had people die at 50, 40, 55, you know. I'm just thinking of death in a metaphorical sense, not even about my physical what death. What about your family? You know, yes. uh, you have a wife, don't you? Yes, I do. And children? Children, yes. How many? Four, ch four, ki four kids, three girls oh. and a boy. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Is the young man taking after you? Is there anything uh, he's learning from you? I hope he is, but I would like him to go, to go his own path. I believe in Khalil Gibran's um, philosophy about children, that they come from us, but not of us. And it is life's longing for life. And that, you know, trying to make them be like us is taking them to yesterday. But that yesterday is gone. So they are tomorrow. I actually want to learn from him. So I keep encouraging him that I want to learn from you. Don't worry about what I have done. Just tell me what you want to do. What are the influences you have today? Because they are tomorrow. I am yesterday. So Interesting. I'm not really looking forward to him to be like me. I'm actually looking that at 70, I'll be expecting him to take me on holidays and show me things that um, you know I didn't know about. What's one word you would say to your wife who is probably watching this program now? Mm -hmm. Who are you talking to? To her. <laughs> so, Once she hears this, she will understand. Okay, for those who don't understand, what, what are you saying? They don't know how much you have prepared. And you have prepared a lot, you yes. know, especially <laughs> for this interview as well. <laughs> Thank you, Osita, for yes. being on this program. My I've pleasure. enjoyed the pleasure of your company. And uh, we we'll look forward to more successes. Thank you very much, I appreciate it. My pleasure meeting the very, very um, inimitable money. Inimitable. <laughs> well, that's the program, The Chats, this week. I am Manny. See you next time. The Chat is produced by Channels Television. You can watch it again online. Just visit our social media platforms, YouTube, Facebook. Thank you.